Welcome everyone to our six part series uh, sponsored by the Bateman Horn Center on the psychology of chronic illness, making it normal. I'm Timothy Wyman. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I provide counseling services uh, through telecounseling through for Utah and Arizona residents for um, individuals who do have chronic illness and chronic pain issues. Uh, that's what's brought me to this topic as well as me being a member of this uh, chronic, the chronic illness community. Uh, the reason that I picked this topic, the psychology of chronic illness, making it normal, is that I found, uh, surprisingly, six years ago when I developed uh, chronic illness, uh, I was surprised at how rare it seemed to be to find even professionals who fully understood uh, the lived experience of the chronically ill. Uh, I would go to doctors and they wouldn't fully understand or communicate this information to me. Additionally, I found even within my own field that there was a lot of lack of education for um, our population and that there's even subspecialties for this, like a health psychologist or a medical social worker. So my aim of this presentation is to hopefully speed along uh, anyone's maybe confusion or disorientation about what really is normal to experience both internally um, as well as externally as you adjust to living with chronic uh, illness. So as mentioned before, this is going to be a six-part series. This is the first part, uh, six uh, topics we're going to cover. The first is going to be development and the phases of chronic illness. The second is going to be anxiety. The third will be depression. The fourth will be identity. The fifth will be relationships. And the sixth will be uh, meaning-making, religion, spirituality, and generally existential existentialism. These are found, if you review the literature, um, all six of these come up quite a bit in terms of what, uh, you know, what are main themes that we wrestle with as those of us who are chronically ill. So starting here with development, um, just some brief uh, overview here. So according to the Center of Disease Control, six in 10 Americans have chronic disease. That's 60% of uh, the population has some kind of chronic health issue. Um, so we're not alone. That's a big thing to realize. Four in 10 have two or more conditions. So 40% have two or more. Now with all of those, that can vary in terms of what's known as functional disability to people who have a health issue, but it's well-maintained and they're pretty much functional all the way down to people who maybe have severe impairment. Um, so secondly, if you look at the second point here, what typically happens as chronic illness develops is uh, not always, but uh, generally there's a slow onset where a collection of symptoms maybe gradually keep manifesting. This can create mystery, confusion, and general disorientation for the chronically ill and uh, can quite, cause quite a bit of significant distress to begin with. Uh, many hide symptoms from themselves and others, and this can actually persist throughout the course of disease based on how much internalized shame and stigma people have about being ill, um, which isn't always irrational because people can often face prejudice and discrimination. Uh, so that can become uh, something that we target and look at when we work with people who have chronic illness. Uh, fourth, people find themselves in a critical situation of profound uncertainty related to that mystery and confusion. Uh, there can be a ton of uncertainty as to what's going on within yourself and how to adapt to it as well as communicate and adjust uh, in all areas of your life as you're experiencing different symptoms. Once individuals' diagnosis can typically take years, especially if you have a diagnosis such as uh, ME or CFS or fibromyalgia, all of which are considered to fall within what's called invisible illness, meaning it's not as obvious, there's not as much research uh, around it, and not as much of the research is communicated to professionals. Uh, so that can delay that diagnosis. But once that diagnosis does occur, uh, it can result in simultaneous relief and fear. So people can be relieved that, that, that there's some kind of name which can bring order to this confusing experience. And also it can provide a trajectory to look at in terms of treatment and expectations. However, there can also be a lot of fear uh, that can come from not knowing what the outcome is with this disease, but as well as knowing if your disease is very uh, severe. I, I, I can think of personally when I was first diagnosed, um, my phone call with my doctor when she told me that I had uh, I, I have rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and she had 
indicated that I had RA and I just, I just broke down in tears because I was thinking of uh, family members who I'd watched have the disease and, and how I've seen it take its toll on them. Um, so uh, once again, there can be that mixture of, of the relief and fear. So related to uh, having multiple chronic conditions, that four in 10, that 40% of us who do have multiple conditions, this can be associated with uh, a higher risk of mortality, uh, impaired functional status, hospitalizations, redundant diagnostic testing, and ambiguous medical advice. So generally speaking, the more conditions you have, typically the, the more adversity you could expect that you're gonna have to come to terms with in relation to living with a chronic illness. So I, in terms of looking at it from a developmental model, like you know, what are stages or phases that people go through, I really like this, um, this phase model of illness. If this interests you and you wanna know more about it, I highly, highly recommend uh, the book that I got this from. Uh, it's by Patricia Fennell, it's called The Chronic Illness Workbook. It's a little bit older, but she was a medical social worker and from working with uh, many people with dealing with all kinds of health challenges, she saw this kind of process happen. Now she labeled these as phases rather than stages. Typically in psychology, we talk about developmental stages because it implies that there's this linear line of once you're done with stage one, you're on to stage two or you're stage three. And that doesn't fit the chronic illness experience because it's not a linear process. Uh, typically, it's cyclical and people can return to these different phases based on an exacerbation of uh, symptoms or a, re or a new manifestation of new symptoms or new issues. And, but to go over these briefly, um, the first phase is one of crisis. Um, I have here in parentheses kind of what are some psychological processes that can be associated with this. In this stage, people can experience anxiety and terror. They can go into denial and bargaining, uh, not wanting to believe that this is what's happening to you, as well as anger to cope with the vulnerability uh, that these new symptoms are coming on. The onset of the symptoms can create chaos, dysphoria, and uncertainty. Anxiety arises as the mind and body are uncertain of the nature and the of the immediate threat. Uh, the crisis stage may also include coping through denial as discussed as the individual seeks to maintain previous levels of functioning. The individual can be hurt or traumatized by the surrounding social system as family, friends, and even practitioners may meet the ambiguity of the symptoms with their own denial. So this can result in minimization or suspicion of malingering or exaggeration, or just a general rejection or lack of interest or concern, which can feed that kind of crisis and terror feeling that can come uh, with this phase. The second phase is stabilization. Now this during this stage, or the, excuse me, this phase, symptoms become more familiar, leading to less disorganization. Uh, chaos or, or chaos as patterns emerge. However, the plateau of symptoms may provide a false, a false sense of full recovery potential, leading to overextension of the self and risk of re-entering the crisis phase. So you can maybe have a, symptoms kind of go down and you think I'm getting better or I am better, and then keep going back to how you, if you acquired illness later in life and weren't born with it, you go back to your previous level of functioning thinking you can do that, become overwhelmed and crash and fall back into that crisis phase. Uh, this efforts to return to previous level of functioning are consistently thwarted. So this can lead to personal feelings of failure and a possible sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Uh, the task of this stage is to stabilize and restructure life and concurrent expectations and perceptions to meet the realities of the new limitations. Uh, again, in parentheses, we hear that, or we see that this people can experience anxiety, denial, bargaining, anger, and even begin to slip into some depression related to all this loss that could be going on at this time. The third phase is one of resolution. Now, during this stage of this phase at this point, individuals have learned extensively about his or, his, his or her symptoms and the practical implications in terms of day-to-day -day living. The reality of the loss of the previous self hits the individual hard, often resulting in significant depression. The task during this phase is to begin developing a new authentic self and philosophy uh, or framework to live by. And so we see in parentheses, this is a stage of grief, 
a lot of depressive symptoms can manifest as you slowly and gra you know gradually moving towards acceptance and adaptation. Now the fourth phase uh, we call integration. Now this is one when the individual continues to experience a plateau of symptoms and relapses, but is able to reclaim parts of his or old, her old identity and integrate them with the new chronically ill self. With the prog progression of illness may come new symptoms. As a result, he or she may be pulled back into phase one. But at this point, you've been through the phases before, and you may work through them faster with the skills you've acquired each time you've gone through them. So at this point, illness has been normalized and integrated into all aspects of life. You've made adaptations to work, relationships, activities, recreation, etc. And the individual moves forward working to self-actualize as an individual with chronic illness. So you know, self-actualization is a way to say, you know, essentially becoming the, your best self to live from your values and passions with your current limitations. Associated with this is adaptation, acceptance, reinvesting in life in a new way, and this term uh, post-traumatic growth, which is when people go through really traumatic events, sometimes further down the road, they can see that there are benefits and that they were changed positively through the difficult thing that they've gone through. So once again, because this is not a linear path, it is more circular. I, I think if we were to represent this, these phases in a kind of geometrical way or through physics, it would be like a spiral or like a spring. You know, those go round and round, but they go upwards as well. And so though you're going to keep cycling through these things, if you commit to keep working on them and facing your reality with courage and honesty and flexibility, you will keep moving upward through them is kind of the general idea. So related to this, um, this phase model, uh, there was one research study I came across that identified the phases of fibromyalgia, um, which I think correlate pretty well probably with most diseases. And the phases of fibromyalgia include first there is onset um, so, and diagnosis. Um, that's you know that phase one, phase two kind of stuff that we just talked about and making sense of the disease. Thirdly, a theme that was found was an invasion of the disease. One participant had said, quote, you're trapped, trapped in this body. You know, it's, it's normal, as I've reviewed different research articles, for people to talk about um, coming to terms with their illnesses, feeling betrayed and trapped by their bodies. And the fourth uh, theme was coping with the disease. So another participant said trying to do things in a pattern and obey the disease becomes a norm, um, trying to find that normalcy and that consistency to mitigate the negative impact of the symptoms. And then lastly, uh, we have a, an ongoing struggle. You know, one participant said, I refuse to give in to it. Now, that statement could actually be problematic because it could be more indicative of if we go back here to phase one or phase two, maybe some denial that, you know, we don't want our illness to take over us and our identity, but we also don't want to uh, reject it and push through things which can make things worse. And we'll talk more about that in subsequent uh, presentations. So a lot of crossover here between this, these themes and the, the phases of fibromyalgia and this uh, four phase model of illness. So I loved this picture here. Um, if you're familiar with Greek mythology, this is Sisyphus. And if you look at the literature, it's interesting that a number of uh, researchers and professionals refer to chronically ill people uh, living kind of a life of Sis Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus was destined to roll a boulder up a mountain, and the minute he'd get it to the top, it would roll back down. Um, and, and I put that out there, not that being chronically ill is ho hopeless, but to really reinforce and validate and normalize that, uh, you know, as this author states, chronic illness brings a prolonged state of impending adversity. But there really is quite a, a lot that people are dealing with um, when they're chronically ill. Some of these tasks that are part of this adversity uh, are listed here. I have your psychosocial tasks. So things psycho is psychological things we're facing internally in terms of our emotions and uh, our thoughts. And then social is, you know, relating to our external world. So managing relationships, uh, work, recreation, play, you know, things of that nature. 
And if you look here on the left side, we have some of the common tasks um, that are added to life when, in addition to just everything that everyone faces, uh, that are added to the plate of the chronically ill. The first one being managing treatments. Um, treatment regimens can take uh, quite a bit of energy in terms of money and physical and emotional energy. Managing symptoms and the illness trajectory. So perhaps trying to stop uh, a progression of your disease um, or just to reduce the overall negative impact of some of your symptoms. Preventing and managing crisis. Uh, you know, you end up back in that phase one with different symptoms. You could end up back hospitalized or um, re hospitalized if you've been there before. Um, additionally, to adding to this too is dealing with healthcare professionals and bureaucracy, which probably many of you know is a full time job in and of itself. Um, normalizing life. You know, our reference point for what's normal can be quite altered and it can be hard depending on what kind of social support we have around us to bring a sense of normalcy to that experience. Preserving a reasonable self-image becomes a huge task. Um, we're going to talk about uh, in another uh, presentation on identity and that effect, how we perceive ourselves and others perceive us is affected. Keeping emotional balance is huge. Um, you know, mental health symptoms are uh, highly what's called comorbid with most chronic illnesses, meaning that it, it's actually more the norm that you're gonna develop some mental health symptoms when you uh, face this much stress. Managing social situation becomes big in terms of uh, relating to others, communicating to others, seeking accommodation so you can be social. Um, related to dealing with the healthcare professionals and bureaucracy, funding the cost of healthcare uh, is quite a barrier. Uh, we still don't have universal healthcare in the United States, uh, which is very problematic. And uh, health, our healthcare is about the most expensive healthcare in the world with some of the least uh, positive outcomes when compared with other developing nations. So if you're in the US, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then preparing for a, an uncertain future can become a huge one as well, not knowing you know, how, how much your disease will advance and when it will advance and how ready you need to be for any kind of decline. And then uh, lastly, adapting to functional limitations. These many symptoms do present functional impairments in which there has to be adaptations made to expectations, energy, physical space, movement, you know, et cetera. So in terms of, if you look here on the right side, I have listed here correlates of poor quality of life. So outside of these tasks, if you have any of these, the research shows that if you have any of these under correlates of poor quality of life, that you'll have more of an uphill climb in terms of improving your quality of life. The first one being inability to work um, and unemployment. This can cause um, quite, as you would imagine, quite a bit of issues, not just psychologically in terms of identity and having value and confidence and self-esteem, but literally materially um, in terms of having stress to meet uh, your basic needs. Second, smoking is a huge one. If you're a smoker, do your best to stop that because that is gonna interact with everything uh, to make things worse. Uh, in addition to that, obesity, um, asthma, making sure that you're treating all of those and reducing or eliminating their presence in your life to the best degree that you can. Fourth is lack of exercise. You know, this is a big one for many of us who maybe are not able to exercise or have to exercise in particular ways. Um, that's associated with poor quality of life. Uh, in addition to accompanying functional disability and general stress, stress will interact with everything. Um, it becomes primary, a primary task and priority to reduce stress as much as you can. And we're gonna talk about that more when we talk about anxiety particularly. So big things to, to look at here. Um, how this can be helpful too is, you know, if you're finding in your chronic illness journey that you're stressed out, you can even get out this list and say, okay, which one is it that's causing me issues right now? And sometimes that can laser your focus down because if you're really upset, it can be hard to really identify where, where this is all coming from. Um, but that's one way that you could use this list um, to kind of help your, yourself. So <laughs> related to the stress, um, I did want to cite this research article. This was showing that um, 
with autoimmune disease, uh, researching rheumatic disease suggests that stressful experience, experience and negative affect might lead to immunological changes, which in turn affect disease activity. So there really is very real findings that when we're stressed out that our immune system can be compromised, other our nervous system, other things of that nature and can really make things worse. So this next slide talks about five elements of successful adjustment. How do we adjust to all this stuff that I'm talking about? Uh, now this could even be a five point treatment plan for anyone in terms of if you were getting mental health counseling or uh, psychological services, we would look at maybe these five areas. Um, the first area would be successful performance on adaptive tasks. So what do we need to do to help you cope and adjust to any physical functional disabilities that you have? This can include occupational therapy, physical therapy, mobility devices, uh, you know, things of that nature. The second would be making sure there's an absence of psychological disorders or a reduction of their impact. So making sure that you're getting you know, whatever treatment uh, you find helps you to reduce the impact of any negative effects on your psychology. Uh, related to that is third, uh, presence of low negative affect and high negative affect. Affect is a psychological way to say our feelings, but it's really important that being chronically ill, that ratio is going to become really imbalanced and negative affect or negative emotionality will become quite high. And so we have to work even harder to rebalance that uh, so that there's more um, positive, um, positive affect that we're experiencing that can come from accessing things that are funny and humor, passions we have, uh, positive relationships and things of that nature that give us a sense of feeling of peace, of love, of happiness, of joy, vitality. And the fourth can be um, adequate functioning status related to work. If you can work, do your best to. Um, the research shows that that can be really important. Um, if you're not able to work, maybe find a way with your disabilities that you're able to make some kind of work go, even if it's like you're doing some kind of art or you're volunteering minimally. And then fifth is just doing a basic inventory of your satisfaction well and well-being in various domains of life. You know, your romantic and sex life, your friendships, your work, uh, work and school. Uh, family life, you know, et cetera, making sure that those are all well balanced and and that fires are being put out related to any of those areas. So lastly, before I get to the final slide, which shows some of the references here, um, is this, I just came across this recent study as of just within the last year. This was interesting in Australia. There, which, uh, the study sample was about 2,000 to 2,500 participants, which is quite high in science, and it gives us more confidence in the generalizability of the results. That they're pretty valid. And in this study, this was a study of those who acquired, acquired a new disability recently. Now in this study, 71.6% of people who newly acquired a disability had mental health symptoms. That is incredibly, incredibly high because most mental health symptoms are pretty low. I think, you know, maybe one of the highest rates is maybe like an anxiety disorder, which I think covers around about 20%. So um, the point being that if you are experiencing mental health symptoms, it is completely normal. You are having a normal reaction to an abnormal experience living with chronic illness. And um, so one, be accepting of that and understanding and kind to yourself, and then also be proactive in addressing that. And we're going to, um, here are references, we're going to get more to that in the next two subsequent slides related to anxiety and depression. If you like this uh, video, we welcome you to view uh, the other five parts in the six part series. And we thank you for your time and attention.